Rub up your engines! some interesting engine technology. Mazda just patented a supercharged two-stroke engine design. Now, two-strokes have twice as much power as four-strokes because in two-strokes, every other stroke is a power stroke. So you get twice as much power because a four-stroke, only one out of the four strokes is a power stroke. So they just naturally have more power. The problem with two-strokes is they've always polluted too much. They burn oil, they did all kinds of problems, but the modern two-strokes, they're completely different than those old smoking ring ding 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 ring ding ding ding. For example, this Mazda supercharged two stroke engine, it has cams, it had valves. The old ones didn't have cams and valves in them, they were a different type of design. The way that they're setting this one up is it's going to have both compression ignition, like a diesel engine, and spark ignition. So some of the time it's just using the pressure of the engine to ignite the fuel. In this case, it's gasoline, they're not diesels, they're gasoline engines. And some of the time it's using the spark ignition system to fire it so that it doesn't pollute. That's all computer controlled and everything. It'll be interesting to see if they actually mass produce these things and they can meet emission standards. If they can, you're going to get a whole bunch of power out of smaller engines. There's no doubting that. But from my experience, the downfall of all two stroke motors has always been they pollute more. You see buses with two stroke engines, smoke's flying out of them. They aren't clean engines. And of course, they're all going for clean engines now. Maybe these technicians have figured out a way to stop from polluting. Who knows? They got it patented. They start making them and trying them out. Who knows? You do get an awful lot of more power with them, but they do have that polluting too much, getting worse gas mileage. So let's get them in the real world because all those Mazda Wankel rotor engines, oh yeah, small engines, lots of power, but they were tremendous gas hogs and they polluted. So if this new engine that they're working on, it's a two-stroke supercharged, will work or not? Well, are you an uppie or a downy? Experts now say that it's not a good idea to pick your windshield wipers off your windshield before a storm. A lot of people do it up north. The windshield wipers when they're down and a snow ice storm comes and ice freezes them on, of course, then the windshield wipers are frozen to your windshield. So if you got them up in the air, then you can scrape the windshield. Now the experts say, no, you shouldn't put them up because if you do, they have a better tendency of breaking. The wind can blow them off. They got all kinds of ideas of why not to do it. Let's face it, when it's really, really cold outside, you got to warm your car up somewhat anyway. And you put it on defrost and put your electric defroster on. If you let it sit for five or ten minutes, the heat of your engine generally will melt and it'll be easier to get off anyways. So it doesn't really matter if you got your wiper blades up or down because it's going to blow where your wiper blades aren't. It's going to melt that anyways. What's the difference if you're scraping like mad with a scraper for a long time or just start your car, let it heat up, melt it, and then it'll just fall right off. But they're saying it's a bad idea to stick them up because when you pick them up, they normally sit like this. You pick them up, you're wearing the springs. Things can snap that are old, which of course is true. I've seen that happen. You got an older car, you pick them up, boing, the spring breaks because it's been down its whole life and now it's up straining and rusted parts break off, you're going to have a lot of wind. It might blow the blade right off or even worse, it might be blowing the right way that it'll slam your blade on your windshield and then crack your windshield. So I got to agree with them here. You're probably better to leave them down. Now I got to laugh. If you saw the picture of Arnold Schwarzenegger's giant Yukon sitting on its side and it was on top of the side of a Prius and then there was a Porsche behind the Yukon wedged under it. This is what a lot of people don't comprehend about those giant vehicles. His was a big old Yukon, right? They look safe. They're big. They're huge, right? But they flip over easily. In this case, he hit the Prius and it flipped it on its side because the tall thing is going to hit a short wedge. It's going to flip over. If you had the battle of a Yukon and a Yukon, the two big ones would be, you know, two bulls pushing each other, rams butting heads. Well, you got little wedge-shaped stuff and big tall stuff. A lot of times the big tall stuff loses. And of course, the hilarious thing is old Arnold was the big environmentalist when he was the governor of California. So everything green and there he is driving around in this humongous Yukon that gets really horrible gas mileage. It's one of the most non-eco things you can drive. Can anybody say hypocrisy supreme and anybody that has to do with governments in this country. You think that you're the safest as you can be in one of these giant SUVs? They do flip over relatively easy. Anything that's got a high center of gravity is by nature somewhat unstable. When you corner or you hit something, you get wedged, boom. Realize that if you're driving one of those things. Don't corner too fast. Don't run over small vehicles because it might flip yours over. <laughs> I can imagine it's an insane amount of money knowing how they rip people off at body shops these days. Heck, they might even have totaled the cars. <laughs> Who knows? Bush Brandon said, I tried selling my eight 
2018 Honda Civic to CarMax, but it was way below what I owe on it. Where could I sell it? You got a 2018, and you are what we call in the business upside down. You owe more money on it than it's actually worth. And the CarMax and Carvanas, they're giving an awful lot of money. You tried CarMax, go to Carvana, try them all, because they're dying to get cars to sell. Maybe you can get some decent money for it. If you're that upside down in a car, realize you buy a new car. The first payment's a lot of interest. You still got a big principal. And the values of them go down 30, 40% or more the first few years of ownership. And I'd say, why don't you just keep it? Honda Civics are good cars. You're upside down now. What the heck? Civics can last hundreds of thousands of miles. You may be upside down now, but if you have it 10, 12 years from now and it's still running fine, you're not upside down. You had your money's worth. When it's lower in value and you still owe a lot of money for it. I mean, try some other places just to see. Carvana, all the other ones. But you may be too far upside down. You'd be better off keeping the car and driving it around. Rocky says, I got a 2010 Corolla. I went to check the spark bugs and the socket stripped out. Now I can't get the thing out. Can you? help me. If you're talking about the socket you used to get the spark plug was just spinning around and you can't get it out, what you'll have to do is get a long pair of needle nose pliers and grab it between the inside where your extension went on and the outside of the socket real tight and pull it out. You just squeeze them real tight. You should be able to wiggle it out. But then the problem is, let's say it's spinning because it stripped the actual spark plug where the hex goes on. Realize that auto parts stores online, they sell spark plug removal tools. When you turn them, the little grooves kind of wave like grooves, and as you turn it, it actually cuts into the spark plug. So if it's all stripped on the spark plug part, it'll grab it and get you enough to get it out. Then, of course, replace the spark plugs with new ones because they're all worn out inside. So either way, you're covered by either a long needle nose pliers or you get the special socket that's made to remove them. And all the, like I say, all the auto parts are online. You can buy them. You don't have to buy a whole set because, I mean, I'm a mechanic. I got a set of like 12 of them, so it'll fit them all. But you don't want to buy an expensive of set, you'll need about one. Barb Perez says, I got a check engine light that four mechanics can't figure out. I got a Buick Regal, and it has the code PO137, which is oxygen sensors. I replaced them both with the OEM parts, and I've even changed the one by the catalytic converter twice. Now I still have that code. I work graveyards as a forensic phlebotomist for law enforcement, so I need a reliable car. Ooh, an interesting job. Okay. Here's the thing. You get a code like that for oxygen sensors. A lot of times, it's not the sensors. It's the sensors reporting a problem because the data is so far off. Realize all those codes are relatively, the PO codes are relatively generic codes. They show you there's a problem in that system. Now, from my experience, you got a nine-year-old car. First, check for exhaust leaks because if you have an exhaust leak in the exhaust system, especially before the oxygen sensor, raw air gets injected, sensor gets a totally false reading. And then it'll trip a code. Oh, the sensor's giving weird data. Well, it's actually giving the data it's getting because there's too much air stuck in and it makes the data so bad that the computer thinks something's wrong. You change with OEM sensors, obviously not them. Check for that first. Exhaust leaks are pretty easy to find. They're going to be making a little noise. You can hear them and when the engine's cold and you start it up, put your hands and if you can feel exhaust coming out, you know, there's an exhaust leak and fix. Often it's the exhaust donut on the headers and uh, you'd feel it and you'd hear it a little bit. It could also be you got a wiring problem. Now for that, you better to pay a mechanic. We've got all kinds of equipment for each frame oscilloscope to see is the correct voltage going into the sensor and coming out to the computer. Could be even a bad connection at the computer where the wiring plugs in. Lots of things can do it. Create something simple, an exhaust leak on a system, because that'll do that. Well, in some states like Pennsylvania, there's Catch-22 going with electric cars. It turns out that the Tesla dealers can't offer a Pennsylvania resident state inspection that they do on the cars because because they don't have emissions equipment. Well, of course, Teslas don't emit emissions, they're electric cars, but here's the catch. The law there is, if you do state inspections, you got to be able to inspect all kinds of cars. So you got to have the machine. Tesla doesn't want to go out and buy these machines to make all their dealerships able to do the testing because, hey, they don't want to spend the money, obviously. And the point that why would an electric car need an emissions test is beyond me. But of course, we're dealing with government bureaucracies here, and we all know what a bunch of crap that stuff is. If you've ever had to deal with it, let me tell you. <laughs>
<laughs> the kicker, of course, is when they combine the safety and the emissions inspection, sure, you'd want to test the Teslas for safety, right? But they bundle them together. They got to do both. But there is no emissions testing in the Tesla because it's an electric car. They can't do it at a Tesla dealer because by law, they have to be able to test all cars. But some places they have to pass emissions testing. It'd be interesting to see what they do because the Teslas don't have OBD ports that we use on all the other cars to test them. Test the exhaust gas to see if it pollutes too much. Oh, they don't have any exhaust gas. It would say, because I knew guys that used to do it in Texas. If you put it in and the exhaust was plugged and didn't have enough flow, it would say low flow, you can't test the car. Well, if there's no flow, I guess you couldn't test the car either. This is where we have government bureaucracies taking over the world. You get stupid problems like this that should never exist in the first place. <laughs> So if you never want to miss another one of my new car repair videos, remember to ring that bell.